Uh, this is the mobility, MIT Mobility Forum organized by MIT Mobility Initiative. Today is really my great pleasure to have Professor Carol Kochmann uh, actually joining me in person. So we're actually sitting together in the same room right? uh, for, for, uh, pr to present her work on congestion pricing. Right. So before I get to uh, uh, the formal introduction, uh, I'll pass to Buwang to announce about our, the way we broadcast and record the sessions. Buwang, please. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, so for this year, we have a few updates that we've done to our mobility forum page. Uh, so all forums are recorded, obviously, you know, with speakers permission. And we upload these within a week on our YouTube channel. And the links, as you can see, are under the, with the camera icon on our mobility forum page on the MMI website. Uh, for this year, uh, the students of the course 11251 are writing annotations. They're adding references to the talk. And we are combining this into a single document along with the speaker slides, again, with their permission and uploading this as well uh, under the download icon that you can see on the web page. Uh, so th this takes about, about two weeks after the talk. So for the first three talks of the season, they, ha they have been uploaded. Uh, we really hope this helps and, you know, adds value. And thank you for joining uh, and hope to see you for the rest of the season as well. Great, thank you, thank you, Boa. So before I start, I, I let me restate the norm of this uh, forum. One, everybody contribute one idea, right? Please, everybody, start type your comments, your questions to Kara in the chat. Right. The second one is uh, whenever you can turn on the video so we have a more interactive uh, session today. Uh, it's already see uh, Kara see a lot of friends and students etc. in this forum. So thank you again uh, for for joining us. So before we start, uh, let me let me do two warm up exercises as we often do before. Uh, the first one is a small poll. Oh, where's my polling function here? Uh, here, give me one second. Oh, Buwang, can you make me the host? I somehow I, I lost my host. Right. Uh, let, let's start with the first. Yeah. Please, everybody in the chat, type in your city, your local time, and organization. So I'll start with Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, 12 known, MIT. So we know who the audience are. Are you able to see the audiences, right? There, there's organization center, right? Nice to see Munich and Naples joining us and Austria. Great. Chile. I'm headed to Montreal in early uh, November in case anybody wants to join us there for the regional science uh, conference. And as we were saying at the beginning, we'll be in Santiago in December for travel behavior research conference. Great. Yeah, thank you for uh, typing this in. Uh, professor uh, Carol Kochman is a dual degree centennial professor of transportation engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. And uh, her work focuses on three parts in transportation. The first is on planning for future implementation of shared and autonomous vehicle system. The second one is on statistical modeling of urban system. And the third one is on the economic impact analysis of transportation policies, such as the credit-based congestion pricing and urban growth boundary. Kara was the president of North America Regional Science Association and sits on the advisory board of the Center for Transportation and the TRB's Autonomous Vehicle Committee, and as well as the International Association of Travel Behavior Research Board. He has received, among many other awards, the Google Research Award, MIT Technology Review Top 100 Innovator Award, and Volox Top 20 of the 2020 Influential Woman in Mobility Award. Without further ado, let me pass the forum to Professor Carol Kochman. Carol, right, please. Thank you so much. It's so fun to be here. This was not planned. I usually teach statistics at this time, uh, but it is family weekend at Tufts University. And so my husband and I are here, and we just happen to be 
um, you know, scheduled for this this week anyway. So it's uh, there's also a regatta going on in the Charles River. So it's a really fortunate time, I guess, that I. especially since New York may have, um, you know, a cord in line going up at around 60th Street or 51st Street eventually, but they are still hammering out those details. And of course, they had a change of governor. So that threw a wrench in the system and COVID didn't do anybody any favors. Uh, so this 20 minute period, I just selected one of the 20 or so papers I have at my website. They're all preprints and easily available to you, but also in journals if, if you have access. And so this one's with Vivian, who was a visiting scholar, just going to try to be online here. So, um, you know, you may be able to type some tough questions in that chat box for her and Yan Tao. He is at National Renewable Energy Lab, and she's back in China at, at one of the, the major transportation universities. And so if you've ever heard about congestion pricing, I hope you've heard about credit-based congestion pricing. This is revenue neutral. So the revenues just go back into accounts equitably. So everybody in the region, let's say, who's an adult gets $20 a month or $40 a month, depending on how bad congestion is there. And so those prices sort of fluctuate to reflect it, especially at the bottlenecks and most of the time you don't pay anything, but when you do uh, exceed your budget, you do pay out of pocket at that point. And so those credits are, are really valuable. That's how we've managed a lot of acid rain contributors from power plants across this nation's worked really well. A lot of people were thinking we might see uh, carbon credits, uh, but the issue is who gets the credit. So that's still gonna remain a tricky issue here. Where do you draw the line um, on age or vehicle ownership or geography, what, what zone you live in? Um, as you can imagine, the tolls, these tolls only apply at peak hours. And of course, if you're traveling long distances, you're gonna you know, value the time savings more presumably, but you will also be paying more. So it's more likely that by the end of the month, you'd be paying out of the pocket, but you'll be arriving at your destinations at at, uh, you know, more quickly. And uh, those who can shift departure times or destinations, modes, and routes uh, can, you know, sort of save money, which they can donate to, uh, to others in the system who are maybe low income, or they could use it uh, for other travel options uh, like transit and um, e-bike rentals, or maybe save up. They might be permitted to save up for their own permanent bike purchase. And so we're doing this application in the Austin region, which is about 2 million people across six counties. But, you know, Stockholm and, of course, Singapore are rather famous. London uh, has just, you know, a simple cord and pull. But that's generally what people set up for simplicity is a single line uh, like the one in Manhattan that they're considering right now. And generally, they, they plow the money into transit after taking off a heavy dose of for administration um, and equipment. So luckily, the costs of uh, congestion pricing are falling dramatically. Little dongles on board vehicles. And you know, uh, one of the big issues, though, is getting those dynamic prices for real-time routing. So Google might be able to tell you through your own cell phone, but it would be nice if your vehicle also had a sense of what would be the best route for you given your current value of time, which I am keep waiting for Google to allow me to enter my value of time into their, their navigation apps. And, and so I'm still working on that. If anybody of you have friends at Google, please get them doing that. Uh, Waze also is a great app that, that Google owns to get that started. They actually finally started showing the goals for me recently. <laughs> so that I've been working on for years, uh, but I need your help. Uh, in this case, Vivian, you know, was just with me for a year. She was a visiting scholar. So she went with a static um, traffic assignment approach, uh, which misses a lot of the dynamics of shifting your departure time. And she grouped everything into just three uh, trip types for passengers. And that's home-based work, home-based non-work, and then non-home-based trips. And She's kind of got like a four-step model with the productions and attractions based on, you know, what's at the, the destination, basically, or what's at the origin, and, and vehicle ownership and income, of course, also affect that generation uh, in, in terms of vehicle trips, but population is the big one for person trips. And so she's got impedance functions and shortest path routing, just two modes in this case, so um, we don't have bike walk, um, you know, Austin's pretty low density compared to where I'm sitting right now in 
in Boston. Um, and we've got a nice variety of travel time groups, but you could set this up any way you want. And so five groups um, from five to $45 per hour. And we take a look at how this, this whole, uh, these different toll scenarios affect each of them. Uh, we of course do have that second mode of transit use and, and we've got pretty low value of time there in, in this simplistic approach uh, because they do not have to drive so they can focus on other things. And we've got four times a day, which is very different from the reality. So I do have other students like McKelly Simone, who did a postdoc here at MIT and Murti Gurumurti, who's now at Argonne National Lab, who do dynamic traffic assignment with congestion pricing and autonomous vehicles. So those papers are at my website if you'd like to see those. The congestion function for each of the links, there's 25,000 directed links in this six county network. They uh, just rise and fall with the volume to capacity ratio. And so many of you have seen this, this simplistic approach. I think the alphas are around 0.8 and the betas around five. Um, so it depends on the, the type of, of link. And we have to decide where and how much to charge um, or to toll basically. Uh, and since technology has been kind of expensive and people are kind of scared um, about being tracked or something, even though on a dongle, you can keep everything on board with you. We decided to say, well, if we only could toll maybe 25 locations, where would it be? And so we were looking through this 25,000 directed link network to find those links that not only have a high volume to capacity ratio, but um, they have a high vehicle miles traveled per mile. Uh, so they're kind of being equitably treated here. And then of course, those four different periods of the day that we're, we're studying the distribution of traffic in, those are a very different length. So um, we, we also control for that duration. And then we add those four ratios basically uh, to see which ones are the most uh, competitive, which ones are the most important to perhaps start tolling if we can only toll at a few locations. And uh, so like in Stockholm and, and other places, they aren't tolling everywhere. Singapore just added cell phones to every vehicle in the fleet because they heavily regulate vehicle ownership in Singapore. So now they do know where all their cars are. And of course, that is a centralized government approach. We probably wouldn't do that here in the U.S. or most, most nations around the world. But we, we can invest money in doing overhead gantries and um, cameras and that kind of thing as a backup to the, the you know, radio frequency identified tag that we have in Texas and, and most places in the world now. And so we first decided to just pick 25, the worst 25, the ones that maybe deserved it the most, and then 50, 100, 500,000 versus if you had a technology that was cost effective to, cross, to cover all links um, or just maybe the seven bridges. So as many of you know, bridges and tunnels are very expensive to produce. They cost about 10 times per lane mile what uh, a pavement at grade would cost. So that's about $100 million per lane mile. And so if you could only start with the bridges, would that solve much? I've always thought, you know, you never want to live on the other side of a bridge. And uh, here in Boston, I'm sure they, they see that congestion quite a bit along the Charles River. Um, so once we have those bridges, we do start simulating or those links that we've decided. We've got 19 scenarios total. Um, one of them is the base scenario with no tolling. And one is just the seven bridge scenario where we toll, I think, $5 per crossing during peak times of the day and $3 in the middle of the day and zero at nighttime, which is the longest period of the day. The nighttime's, you know, on the order of 12 hours. Uh, but the other links get told either at the marginal social cost on that is above your average cost when you're you're taking that route um, and that we're going to call tau or we charge below that because in most of these settings we are not pulling every link and so it there's a lot of relinks there's a lot of free routes and so a marginal social cost toll would be too high and in that case um, and then um, but you could also argue, well, you should actually increase the toll when you're not tolling all links because that person is not just passing that point and using that particular link. She's uh, loading the links upstream of it and downstream of it. So she's actually causing a lot more delay than you're going to catch at that one place where you happen to have maybe an overhead gantry if you're going to go with current, you know, pass or I guess conventional technology on tolling. And so the bridges was very different. It was pretty simplistic. And we also didn't. Um, you know, over toll when we tried um, putting 
tolls everywhere based on a GPS type system with some kind of cellular communication so you know what the uh, toll is at that time of day. So how bad it is, because it, it can change, it's dynamic. And, and so um, in all the works I've talked about, not just this static traffic assignment project that I'm showing you right now, but the dynamic work, we are looking for this difference between your cost, which is the average cost that everybody with you on that link L is experiencing and what the true marginal social cost of your adding yourself to that link is because of the delay that you're basically imposing on those behind you in the traffic stream. So this involves a derivative of that BPR function I talked about earlier. And then we're not really sure what that's gonna be because once you start tolling, people start shifting. And so you have to iterate uh, the traffic assignment. And we're doing this in Transcad, by the way. So thank you to our friends at Caliper who are located here in the Boston region. A lot of MIT grads work there and uh, we're using Transcad to implement this. So we're using method of successive averages to kind of update the tolls uh, through a series of iterations to find stability. And uh, using an average value of travel time, I think $25 per hour per vehicle um, in that traffic stream to, to set a single toll. So it does depend who's on the link with you. If there's really wealthy people with high values of time, I guess you could toll higher, but we're not getting into those weeds. And we are using nested log sum. So this is kind of a economically rigorous approach to, to coming up with people's willingness to pay effectively for this new setting where now they're paying tolls, but they're getting to their destinations faster. Or they can go, if they have a low value of time on that trip, they can go out of their way and take a longer route uh, and avoid tolls, but they're still getting a budget every month. So that, that is helping with uh, any tolls they might incur. And so this is just um, an inclusive value here. This is a log sum over the two motorized modes that we have in this model. And of course, those both depend on time and cost by those modes. And the cost of the automobile involves some parking costs at some of the downtown zones and other you know, high demand destinations. And uh, the bus also has an uh, alternate specific constant that's quite negative because a bus is generally not preferred uh, for a variety of reasons, not as comfortable. Uh, there's a walk and, uh, and, and access cost on both ends, basically. And then we bring that up into the upper level of this nested logit on the destination choice, where you know the attractiveness variables, which typically include jobs and population, are being compared to just a base. Since this is all in utils, so we can leave it relative to a base case and include that uh, inclusive value that's over those two lower um, choices, those mode choices. And then we take the difference in the log sums, the nested log sums between the base case of no tolling and one of those 18 other scenarios to see who wins, who loses across all the thousands of zones that make up the region and those five different user classes. So at that point we're averaging. And that's, so this is a change in consumer surplus effectively or a willingness to pay. We do it a little differently for the, the home-based non-work and non-home-based trips versus the home-based work trips, because in the short term, we do not expect people's job locations and those work trip destinations to change. And so um, for the, the places where you do have some destination choice, which is usually your non-work and non-home-based trips, uh, we're taking that difference and marginalize, or, and normalizing by the marginal utility of money for the different purposes. Um, but for the work trip, we're doing a weighted average, basically, of the marginal utilities over the two modes, because you don't have much destination choice <laughs> flexibility, at least in the short run, for many of us. Um, and then we go ahead and try to figure out what those congestion costs are. And then that varies depending on the scenario. And so there's 18 scenarios that have tolls in them. And uh, just going to give you a set of pictures here at the four times a day. So the AM peak is a two hour period. Uh, the midday MD is probably like a four hour period. The PM peak is a three hour period. And that's where you see most of the tolling happening. You see most of the red and you're seeing it mostly on the freeways because those are heavily loaded uh, locations. So they, they, they attract more attention. If we're only going to, you know, toll on a hundred of these directed links, they're gonna to tend to be the heavily used places where we make that investment uh, versus focusing on smaller roads. And then at nighttime, you know, there's there are some links that get told at maybe two cents a mile, but, and they tend to be that those same positions where we, we have to stick with the same 100. So it's that same 100 at all four times a day. Once we choose those links, 
they're set. And so those are, those are, you know, tolls of maybe one cent, two cents a mile at night, only at those 100 positions over the lengths of those links, some of which are, you know, two miles long, but generally not much longer than that. So very light tolls at night anywhere, zero most everywhere, because there's 25,000 links and we're only charging tolls on 100 of them. And so this is 2,258 zones or neighborhoods, and we're calculating the average willingness to pay for this policy in each of those zones for each of the five user classes. And we're looking at mode shifts as well as changes in vehicle miles traveled and vehicle hours traveled. And in Austin, using this kind of static approach to this question, we are seeing moderate increases in BMT and of course VHT because people are taking paths that are not really their shortest paths, but they do not want to pay those tolls. So those with lower values of time for those particular trips are going to shift. And you're seeing the biggest increases come when they're, they're having to shift the most. So those highly told scenarios where we're doubling that marginal social cost because we're saying, well, they're, they're actually imposing more delay than we can see because there's a lot more links that they're using than just those 100 that were, or those 25 that we're applying the tolls on. And then the 1,000 toll link scenario. So that was the, the most uh, tolling positions that we had before we shifted to the every every link could be tolled if it if at that time of day it merited some kind of toll. And so that would be a GPS-based system. And the mode choice didn't shift much. I mean, you're seeing people still heavily sticking with driving because we don't have great transit in the, the Austin region. If you do this in Chicago, we see a much bigger shift. Uh, even for the very low value of time, people at $5 per hour continuing to rely on those personal vehicles. And congestion impacts, uh, we drew a line at a VC ratio of 0.7. And so just looking at the changes in the percentage of VMT that is experiencing those high VC ratios um, during this morning peak and during this afternoon peak, tends to be um, lower in the morning because uh, people are just mostly headed to work and school. Most of us don't wake up that early unless we have to be somewhere. And so most of the trips are occurring in the PM peak and that's where you're seeing, you know, 10 to maybe 18% of the vehicle miles traveled under these different, these 19 different scenarios being, you know, uh, affected at, at feeling that congestion, really feeling like it's hard to maybe merge with the lane next to you and your speed might be somewhat affected by the queuing um, and, and I guess headways in front of you. And so we, we see the VC ratios falling in, you know, from seven to five percent and the AM peak once we add the tolling on most of those scenarios, but not necessarily the 1000 link toll scenario. Um, not sure. <laughs> I'm going to try to illuminate this a little bit with my, my pen. So this, this scenario was the trickiest one on this one. Well, it's not really illuminating. Um, it's not leaving a mark here for me, um, but the 1000 link scenario was the trickiest when we, we told on all links, we, we just told at the marginal social cost or half. We didn't try to double the toll because that wouldn't make any economic sense. Um, and then the afternoons too. So there's about, you know, six to 16% of, of traffic right now that occurs at the high VC ratio. And it, it, mostly falls under these scenarios unless you're you're trying to toll a lot of links um, or all of the links um, then you know some of the shifts end up being onto to routes that have low tolls but may have higher vrc ratios so the credit calculation comes next and so once we have those sort of stable tolls uh, for an equilibrium we Sum, sum that up and take 10% off to use for the overhead costs. And I should tell you that 10% is less than what the current conventional tolling systems require. Uh, but they're pretty sporadic. And I think when London started its area toll, I think 65%, they, they were using closed circuit TV and they were dumping like 60% of those revenues right into the administration of the system, which was terrible. Nowadays, the toll has risen in London, and I think maybe 25% is going to overhead and about 75% is being spent on transit. Uh, so underground uh, and other improvements there to help ensure people can make it to their destinations, even if they don't want to pay that, that very hefty toll, which is on the order of $20 uh, to get into that area. And then we uh, give that other 90% to the licensed drivers in the six counties. And so that is 
a big decision. You may feel like it, everybody, only those who live on the periphery should get it, or only those who live centrally, um, or only those who drive a lot. Uh, but you know, I also feel that any adult um, should probably be able to receive credits uh, because if they want to bike all the time, that's fantastic. We want to pay them basically to stay off the road. Um, so here's the here's just a, a particular set of um, scenarios, uh, not all 19 or 18 relative to the base case. These are the where we charged kind of a high toll, except when we're doing all the links, we're not going to charge that high toll. Or when we're doing just the seven bridges, we're going to charge $5 to cross the bridge at peak times of the day and $3 midday and zero uh, during the 12 nighttime hours. So the seven bridge toll leads to a fair amount of revenues each day, almost a million. And then the, the many links being told leads to um, heavy revenues as well. And so we have about 10% of that for administration and the other 90% gets distributed. So it results in budgets of maybe, you know, $3 um, per month. If they were only charging 25 points in the system, we only have the entries at those positions um, or maybe $16, $17 a month if we're doing the bridge tolls at $5 a crossing. Um, if you've been to Austin, I can tell you the, you know, I-35 is infamous and um, MOPAC is also a, a big deal, but all of the other bridges get loaded pretty heavily as well. And then, you know, if you really want to charge a uh, toll people, I just 1,000 links, that, that leads to the, the heaviest, but we do not recommend that scenario. So the all link scenario with the marginal social cost application is about $35 a month in our region. That's going to be more if you live in DC or near Manhattan and, and here in Boston, I think, but you know, a lot less in, in other parts of the, the nation. And uh, so most of those are being told kind of heavily, but again, we're just tolling at marginal cost tolling when we're get, going to all links and uh, you know, sort of a fixed toll of five or three dollars on those bridges. And so Another big issue is the equity of this kind of thing. Is it, are these Lexus lanes? Well, no, I, it turns out even if you have, you are in that $5 per hour user class, you are uh, generally willing to pay for this using you know, the expected difference in those nested log sums. And so we're gonna look at, at just in this case, I'm gonna show you pictures for the home-based work trip uh, to give you a sense, but there of course are lots of trips that are taking place in those other categories. And I'm just going to focus on the, the middle value of time group, uh, but the results are really not that different. Um, so over 90% of travelers benefit in all of these groups from this kind of distribution. Uh, but you know, we are assuming here that that money can be used. And, and one of the issues with a credit-based toll is fraud. So people pretending that they live in the region, they're there that month, they're not in Europe having a holiday and they get cash. So in reality, you would not cash this out, but you would try to make the use of that money flexible. So it wouldn't just be for driving, but it would be for bus passes or bikes, maybe a kayak on our, our river, um, but that's about as far as it goes. So they'd have to consume it locally and at the end of the month, it disappears. So um, if we're doing the 500 uh, link example and we're doing the heavy tolling or the half tolling, um, you're seeing almost every zone benefiting uh, except for the, the dark ones, which are showing towards the periphery here. And those are very rural zones, by the way. And of course, this is sort of a false boundary that we draw around these six regions. There are other places they can drive to. They can drive to the next county that's on the periphery, on the perimeter of this. And so they, it's, things are not as bad as we, we're painting them here, especially in this right-hand side where you see a lot of dark. There's a lot of uncongested or untold places that they can travel to that we're not really permitting in our destination choice set here. And so 97%, um, you know, would if they were rational actors, maybe would be willing to pay for or you know voting for this. This they think they'd be better off under that um, heavy toll scenario, and uh, just ninety one percent under the half tolling scenario. So uh, the devil is in the details. You know how where we toll and what rate we toll, and there's arguments in both directions if you're tolling just a subset of links. Uh, if we're tolling 500 links versus all links, and here um, we've mixed it up, so sorry, there's a little bit of, um, uh, I guess, uncomparability between this VOTT5 and 3, but I can tell you that pretty much, you know, everybody, this is 98% and 99% voting for this policy on average. Of course, every traveler is unique, and some months you may be happy, and some months you may be sad for whatever reason. You had, um, you know, special events you needed to get to downtown. I'm not sure, but 
um, it does it does vary uh, by person. And so these are really just averages. Um, so it was sad to see vehicle miles traveled and hours traveled rise. We don't normally see that in a lot of the transportation economics papers that are published in large part because most people are using fixed demand systems. If they're gonna do anything as complicated as a real network, they're gonna stick, typically the network modelers will stick with fixed demand and I'm allowing, or Vivian's really allowing destination choice here and of course mode choice. And so those are often missing in the, in the complex applications that you see. Um, and you know the, the biggest problem was when we were pulling a subset just a, a thousand links, let's say out of 25,000, and we're tolling them at a high rate. And you're seeing a lot of circuity and travels. People try to get where they want to go at those same times of day. Of course, we're not allowing departure time flexibility here. And that's going to be a nice, a nice um, choice set that people truly have uh, that, that we didn't get to in this paper, but luckily Murti and McKelly get to in their other papers. Um, so the, I guess the toughest, one of the toughest groups to serve would be the low value tra travel time travelers. And so the worst case that we came up with was an 85% of zones benefiting. Um, so the average person in those, those zones. So there were 15% of zones when um, we weren't, you know, in our worst case scenario where they might not vote for this policy if they were rational actors. Um, and yeah, the credit-based congestion pricing across all congested links uh, was really the best scenario tested, but it does require that new technology to keep the cost of doing this down. Um, and of course, freeing up those work locations, allowing added modes and the departure time uh, choice is, is going to definitely enable larger benefits, I think. So that's it for my 20 minute spiel. I do have more slides that Jin was seen uh, that get into the dynamic traffic assignment work if, if we end up going that direction, but it's up to you guys. Great, thank you so much, Kara. yeah. So here, uh, first of all, I encourage everybody, please put your question and comments in it, uh, but also today, uh, uh, Professor Juan, uh, Juan de Dios uh, Chusa happened to be in the audience. So I invite Professor Altuza to give some remarks first. Then I have a couple of questions with Kara as well. Uh, Professor Altuza, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, very unfair to the rest of the audience, uh, but, but and actually, I, I don't have very much to say. Uh, thank you very much, Cara, for your presentation. I, I was very interested. Uh, unfortunately, I think the case of Austin is not particularly interesting in the sense that people don't have much choice uh, in terms of public transport, apparently, and therefore your reactions were very small. Um, I wonder if you apply this in a in a place which has much better public transport, the, the, the results would be interest much better. I like the idea that you mentioned about the, the system being equitable in the sense that since you're not gaining money, you are giving the money back to other people. The usual uh, complaint about the system is in a sense taken into account. And that that is nice. I haven't seen that before. Um, and I think that that would be my comments really, no more, thanks. <clears throat> yes. So luckily, um, Murti's work uh, was in the Chicago application. And so since he's at Argonne National Lab, which is uh, located in that region, you know, a lot of his work and he does have a paper coming soon. So stay posted. Um, hopefully in the next month or two, my website will add another paper. But from what we've been seeing in all our Chicago results, um, yeah, there's definitely a bigger shift to transit. So that's another option that is, is available because of the, the long-term investments. It's a much older city uh, in terms of when the population really was added. So pre- automobile and that means that those those investments provide a nice out uh, for those who want to get off the road great uh, thank you yeah so i'll start with a set of questions on the behavior economic side then move to the technology implementation and engineering side i uh, hope leave some room for a little bit discussion on the policy and practice side right so start with the behavior side so here because we, we start to introduce a lot of complexity in the in the chart regime do you assume that each consumer, each driver, actually know upfront what their charge will be, given the dynamicness of it, or they will be calculated after the fact? They only learn uh, afterwards, and they can then inform the future decision. Yeah, so people really love certainty. Um, we've seen that with cell phone pricing and, and all sorts of pricing. Um, so you want to buy, be able to buy ahead and. Um, in this case, so Singapore actually does set most of its tolls ahead of time, and they have a citizens group doing it, and that's really nice. Um, but 
here we we do let the model equilibrate and then we um so once the routes have been chosen so we presume we know what people are going to do and then we set the tolls and then they know those tolls when they make those destinations so there's this game that's being played over and over quickly by us to to guess it and then we hope we've guessed it right but you're absolutely right if there's an incident for example and you lose a lane the congestion is going to rise but Generally, we wouldn't um, want the, the toll to rise, but the travel time is going to be different than we had assumed. And so that will cause some route changes thanks to this handy device called the cell phone with those um, amazing navigation apps. Those things just kicked reliability to the or unreliability costs to the curb years ago. We were so lucky that uh, Google invested in that. And then Apple came up with its own iMaps um, that has completely changed the unreli unreliability piece of the equation for so many of us. And that was a huge cost that was just getting worse. It was starting to outstrip the average cost of congestion in many of our regions. And so that was a big gift. So thank your friends who work at, at those companies. Right. The second question more on the on the technology engineer side, let, let me offer two interpretations of this. So I, the first one is the technology in from the implementation of congestion pricing itself, right? Like you, you said, in London, we're still using the camera, very old fashioned coordinate system. While today we have a whole bunch of a sensor technology that allow us to do much better approaching the first best pricing if we choose to here, right? So tell us a little bit more about the technology trend in that. But second one, of course, is another sense, which is, pricing of the new mobility technology. That's an entirely different question there, which is you have done a lot of work on if we start to have autonomous vehicles, you start to have connected vehicles, right? Uh, shared mobility vehicles. How would the pricing, uh, we need to rethink the pricing to, in, to accommodate new technology of mobility. Yeah, so any of you who's in a GM vehicle, they know where you are every second of the day, or they know where, uh, sorry, not where you are, where your vehicle is. So <laughs> you can give the vehicle to somebody else and they will track that person. They know whether he's braking and how fast he's doing, whether he's using his window wipers. So some vehicles have a lot of technology on them and they are communicating with the mothership. Um, I think some of the Teslas too, if you bought the autopilot package. <laughs> but um so the, the technology is already embedded in a lot of the newer vehicles or, you know, depending on the manufacturer. Uh, but, and I do think that I recommend because there's always those privacy experts that are going to fight and a lot of them, you know, have JDs next to their name. And so they do not want us. And I don't really want to keep track of where they are anyway. I think um, public agencies really don't want the liability of their employees knowing where people are. And so um, having sort of a untamperable device on board the vehicle that is auditable is really important. So I recommend a dongle that and, um, you know, um, that that keeps the information in case your cell phone battery dies down. So, you know, you can have an app, you've got this computer with you, but if you forget to turn it on or there's two people using their phones in the same car and they're both getting told, that's a problem. So it's best to keep it locked um, on that vehicle in the onboard port, if you like, um, so you can just tie it in as a dongle and then it could dump the information onto your phone or your spouse's phone and you can upload that to an account. Uh, but that, that does need to be auditable because you know we have seen tampering with odometers and things like that in the past. And it's probably still possible for somebody who's really sophisticated to tamper with his odometer. Um, but these devices, because they're electronic, are hard to mess with. Um, the, the problem is if somebody removes the dongle, then that vehicle is traveling without a tolling meter on it. And um, and so I, you know, I, I do imagine that when you pass under certain gantries, that maybe these ugly gantries we already have where we do have tolls, or you're at a gas station like they did in the Oregon pilots, you will reconcile your bill and your account will catch up. Um, so you'll know for that month or that period. Um, what, how much you owe, and, and so it'll reconcile that way. Um, and of course, if you leave the country for a few months, you, your vehicle will stay registered in that region, and maybe somebody will get some use of your vehicle, maybe a renter at your home. We've done that, um, but you know that you just you can't use that money um, if you're if nobody's physically present taking um, advantage of it. And yeah, I'm I'm gonna go with a dongle. Singapore and China are probably just gonna put phones on board the vehicles and keep track of uh, a lot more than that. Um, but you know, uh, here in the U.S., I think it'll probably look like a dongle, and maybe the manufacturers will eventually embed it in all the new vehicles as well, so you don't have to 
sacrifice that onboard port, but um, we do want all conventional existing vehicles to be able to lock in as well. Mm -hmm. And second part of the question is when autonomous vehicle and connected vehicle, these new technologies come in, do we have to rethinking of our pricing philosophy here? How do we accommodate that? Right. So when I'm in a, a self-driving vehicle, which has happened a few times in my life, um, you know, my supposedly my value of time goes down by 25 to maybe 50 percent because I'm not the one in charge anymore of trying not to hit other vehicles, which is your main driving task, folks. Uh, and so uh, yeah, it, we do expect a lot more VMT, and I, I do have a, a slide here I can share with a bunch of papers, and one of them, and I'll do that in a second, but one of them is about the added VMT when we simulate this, because this is going to affect freight as well, and freight is now, you know, 10% of maybe our VMT, and then we've got all these commercial deliveries being made, that's another maybe 10% of the VMT, and, and so... Uh, all these things are being affected. A lot of airlines are going to lose revenue relative to this upward trend that we've long seen with the aviation industry, but they, a lot of short trips are going to come down onto the ground. A lot of people are not going to go uh, super far. They're going to stay within the nation. And so you're going to see a lot more loading, I think. Um, but of course, a lot of people are working from home now. Um, so maybe they have more choices on, on, on when they, they travel and, and some of that will be at night while you sleep. And so that's going to definitely put pressure and we really need this, uh, especially if we want to allow cars to travel empty, which I highly, uh, well, I, I cannot recommend that at all. Um, so anyone you talk to, no private vehicles should be driving empty, but the shared fleets should be allowed to drive up to about 20% empty after getting credits for ride sharing. And actually most of our simulations now with Austin and Chicago, the um, ride sharing element is so popular that it, it cancels out the VMT that those people would have done had they traveled independently in cars. And so you actually see a reduction in VMT, uh, although it is inspiring farther destinations and, and more travel. So if you cannibalize transit, then you can also see more VMT, even if you have high loads in those seats within those shared vehicles. Great. So last question from my side, and I'll give it to Buon for the audience question, which I'd like to see from the academic point of view, uh, starting from like uh, Arthur Pigot in the 20s talking about Pigot and Tex, then Gerald Harding talk about the tragedy in the commons of the 1960s, and then Professor William Wickery start to incorporate specifically to engine pricing within transportation system. I'd like to see how, how do you see the academic research evolve in this? What do you see as the most exciting kind of future research in this realm? Which part we still don't know, we better do more research for the student and the junior uh, uh, researchers who want to get into the area. What's your advice? Well, what I would really like to see, um, you know, is that technology deployed. So I, um, I'd really like to see you guys getting your hands dirty with some physics and um, just um, selling these things um, to put into people's dongles to demonstrate. And I think, you know, our friends at Metropia have these sort of phone based apps where they're keeping track of people's travel and trying to give them incentives to avoid congested times of day and congested uh, portions of the region. So it's pretty easy to demonstrate if you're handy with, you know, an app or um, other equipment. Um, and I'd love to see it priced. So that's been really hard for us to get the pricing straight on this at scale. Um, and of course, you know, helping deploy it. So I'm, I'm kind of sad that in New York, it's going to be a big fee just to cross a little line, you know, sort of an invisible line in the road. And if you cross it and you drive around all day, you pay the same amount that a person who crosses it and parks. And that's, you know, that's not equitable. It's not, um, it's not efficient. So hopefully we'll, we'll see some changes there. Um, I think, you know, academically, we've been doing theoretical research in this realm for a long time. And yeah, the DTA stuff is important. And we're very lucky at UT that uh, my students and I get to work with Argonne National Labs Polaris program because that allows DTA at scale, which I've never really seen done well. Um, Matt Sim does it for, you know, um, without a proprietary um, hurdle, which is great, but we can only simulate about five or 10% of the vehicles and we don't get destination choice in um, those, those models yet. It's just too computationally intensive. So that's why we we're going with Polaris. Nice. Move on. Yeah. Audience question, please. Hi, hi. Thank you, Kara. Uh, the the audience uh, chat has just exploded, so I'll just try to keep it in various themes. Uh, so the first one is similar to something you just mentioned. So Daniel asked, do you take into consideration where I am driving to or from? 
for example if i'm crossing a toll road when i'm driving to take the metro or commuter rail will i still be you know treated the same way as a guy who's just driving around or a guy who's gone and parked in downtown boston things like that you know so uh yeah uh, yeah so it's uh, you know what point so every link is treated like um a gantry point a potential gantry point so when we told all links um it just depends what the vc ratio on your link is and um it, you know, most times a day in most locations, your toll is zero. Uh, but if you are going to a transit station, maybe, you know, you'll get some kind of credit. I, I don't know that people might appreciate that. But um, what if you have, you know, people in the car with you? So how do we credit you for that? It, it gets really tricky. So usually it's to keep it as simple and, and non-chaotic as possible. It's, yeah, where your vehicle is and when, and that that will trigger the charge. Okay. Uh, the other theme is, you know, you publish the results for Austin where the VMT actually went up and, you know, so the chat was, you know, ex exploding with people asking, is there similar research for, you know, cities like New York City, you know, given the disparity in incomes in New York City. So will you have more of the VOTT classes? You know, I think you had five, if I'm not mistaken. So how would that assumption change? And, you know, how would the results compare to Austin, you know, a commuter friendly city, like relatively commuter friendly city like Manhattan or, you know, Cambridge? things like that yeah 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 so austin unfortunately is pretty expensive place to live these days we've got a lot of uh, wealthy californians we've got some tech headquarters and of course elon musk recently although most of his money is you know in his company it's not in his uh, bank account um but yeah i think um new york you know you've got better options like chicago does um for many things so that's great i think ride sharing is a wonderful way to go you know i was really sad when covid kind of killed that um for the tncs and i really want to see that come back uh cruise is coming to austin in a couple months um they're parted mostly owned by gm i guess and vw in the in the europe stage and they will be having shared rides they also have an origin vehicle with um doors opening in both directions. Um, so it's a six seat or three facing three. Yeah. These kinds of options will be really nice. I, I, I do think that's going to be um, life saving. And a lot of people don't drive, they don't want to drive, it's very dangerous, insurance is expensive. So paying by the trip and sharing with other people is, is a great way to go. And of course, we share rides all the time in automated vehicles when we get into elevators. And a lot of times you're on autopilot when you're in, a, in a, a plane and you've got plenty of people around you you don't know, hundreds of people you don't know. So I hope you guys are all up for it. I know I am and I've always enjoyed my shared rides. And I think that will really help even in a place like Austin. Um, uh, another I don't question. have New York City results. Uh, we will have Chicago results. And if Murti's on the line, he's welcome to type stuff into the chat box about um, some of the other cities they're simulating. Thank you. Uh, another question was about the marginal social cost calculation. You know, we've had various presentations on the actual societal cost of, you know, owning a car and running a car, the cost of society. So does your estimate include information on the societal cost of air quality, greenhouse gas emission, particulate matter, you know, vehicle noise, or is it just primarily based on the personal value of travel time? Yeah, so I try to pay attention to everything because I'm kind of an economist and a planner at heart. Um, you know, I've got, I've got minors in economics and, and a master's in planning as well. And I have to tell you that emissions is really low. Um, we look at it all the time. In fact, the dissertation defense I was in earlier with my student, I have him price everything. And, um, you know, like the power plants, because he's doing smart, automated, all electric vehicles with strategic charging uh, throughout the day and even discharging. Um, so uh, the, the power prices are so low and, and the emissions really are not going to move the needle on that decision much. Um, but yeah, there can be spikes in, in energy prices and then that, that can have trigger something. But Generally, and especially in this country with the incredibly small taxes that we have on these, you know, highly toxic materials, it's like the most dangerous thing you ever come in contact with is the gasoline at the pump. So um, it, it is a really bad, you know, thing. It should be at least a dollar per gallon, probably two dollars per gallon or three dollars per gallon on diesel. So our military expenditures and all this stuff to protect those lines, um, that's where the real cost comes in. It's not so much from our breathing it. And even, you know, the carbon cost, even if you price it at a hundred or two hundred dollars per ton um, for the carbon dioxide equivalent, 
it doesn't move the needle much. Um, so that the tolls, I would add them though. I hate to see stinkers. I, I also am hoping we will get an app for our phones where we can um, watch bad video, bad cars driving super fast or um, emitting smoke or noise and just upload it to a website um, where then it's, it's shared with the relevant um, enforcement authorities so they can clamp down on those guys because the police are are not out there. I mean, they cannot be everywhere anyway, uh, but they definitely aren't out there. They're hardly ticketing anybody anymore. And there's a lot of rules being broken. So um, I think, you know, you and I with our cell phones can capture a lot of bad stuff and, and hopefully get those those smokers out of the way. So on the topic of regulation fees and the government, so there were a lot of comments saying how politically this is a hard sell in the US. You know, people are accustomed to, you know, freeway tolls and, you know, to extract money from them, you know, it's like, uh, it's the price on their freedom. Uh, so if if you were to approach, you know, a government in Austin, you know, so what would your sort of elevator pitch be for some of some of the question, you know, how, how does one even start the conversation in, from a political point of view to implement this? Right. So the credit base is really nice. Like, wouldn't you like to have a budget to start with? And so you feel like you, you're starting ahead of the game, right? And then you can kind of strategically make decisions. And we all do this, um, you know, when we buy gas or buy food or uh, choose restaurants. I mean, we're choosing based on pricing all the time. And we've all created this roadway. So the money shouldn't just go to the DOT and they can do whatever they want with it. It really should come back to us in the form of credits. Of course, the infrastructure costs and the emissions costs and all that, if you want to tack those on and use the same technology, you can keep those and use them um, to, you know, help kids with asthma or to add uh, more scrubbers to power plants or to invest in renewables and all these things. Um, and, and But traditionally, most people have kept the congestion tolls to invest in the local transit system. But in a place like Austin, that's going to benefit a very slim share of the, the travelers. So it's not a big winning argument either. I, I'd just love to see us getting budgets, but trying to keep the administrative costs down. And a lot of that is the technology costs. So um, I just, we need some, we need some de demonstrations there um, and, you know, smart people uh, at this institution and, and others um, showing some, you know, deployments with students or with whomever. I, th I think we can do that. So, I mean, to your point on, you know, getting a budget and investing it into public transit, uh, so cities like Austin and most of the U.S. without much public transportation, will this charge actually make the lower income commuters worse off initially, you know, till the public transit is actually brought up to an acceptable level? Uh, is, do, should we approach that first, address that first before, you know, thinking of a, a credit-based congestion charge or, or do both simultaneously? Yeah, I mean, so what we've seen, even with the low value of time travelers, which tend to be, you know, people with a lot of time on their hand or very or hands and or very low income. And so, yeah, lots of benefits still for those classes all over the place. So regardless of where your home is, um, we're trying to keep track of that for you. And yeah, it just it seems like every group, if rational, would you know tend to vote for these kinds of policies. But what I would like to see is transit agencies like Austin's using that half cent sales tax to um, deploy shared rides that are much more on demand and much more you know time efficient for these low income households. And that's part of why we study shared autonomous vehicle fleets with ride sharing is we're trying to figure out what the cost would be and wouldn't it make a lot more sense rather than Capital Metro in Austin spending $1.70 per um, a person mile, per a passenger mile, $1.70. Okay, that's a, a lot more than Uber and Lyft cost if you travel with somebody else. Uh, couldn't they just um, invest that in the TNCs um, competitively? So you don't want to have a monopoly. Um, but yeah, Singapore you know, has co competition for all of its bus routes and everything. And we, we really should see more of that um, on the transit side of things. And I think that would make life so much better. Um, of course, we do see TNCs in transit deserts, and we do see a few um, transit agencies experimenting maybe with allowing vehicles to um, share a zip car, or sorry, not vehicles, um, households to share um, these zip cars and others if you qualify. And of course, you have to have a driver's license to do that. So not everybody can do that. But that makes great sense to me, too. Much better use of the money than, you know, almost two dollars per passenger mile is what we're investing on the transit side. And almost all of that is subsidy. 
talking of Zipcar, actually, we had Robin Chase who put in a few comments about there was a, I think, a survey in Bogota using the cell phone based data. Uh, Robin, I mean, if you'd like to ask your question, we'd be happy to, you know, if you could unmute yourself. If you're still Hi. on the call. Um, I am still here. Sorry about that. Um, this was delightful. Thanks. It was so in intriguing to me. I, I guess I was making more of a comment that a lot of the work that you did was based on where infrastructure would go or how much infrastructure we'd have to put in, which are the points. And if we can think about technology that's not infrastructure based, then it's dynamic and smooth throughout the geography. But I was really intrigued by the whole congestion credit based piece. And I just wanted you to maybe say a few more words on how did, we know that congestion pricing itself is so politically impossible to do. And so does this credit based work? And I feel like the name is a little hard, um, but the idea is great. <laughs> but so how does that, what, what's your impact? What do you think, does it work? Well, you know, I'm talking to policymakers. Um, I mean, yeah, they're definitely intrigued, but you're right. It's really hard to explain to like a layman. Um, you know, it sounds so simple to me, but you know, many of you are probably still kind of confused, but puzzled by it. And it's, it's, um, yeah, you just kind of a guaranteed budget for you if you qualify. And so that's another place for research, Jinwa, is who qualifies. Um, so those of you who are in the humanities or policy, oh my gosh, how do we draw that line on who qualifies? Um, do you have to be live close to uh, a, or to work close to um, one of these points that gets told? Does it have to be above a certain toll at, you know, over the course of the month um, before you start to qualify? Are there different levels uh, of credits uh, for different people? But I do think a lot of people do not need these credits. I know a lot of elderly people that stay home. And if I were they, I would just donate it to a fund that then gets parceled out to these low income travelers. So they end up with maybe 50% or double their, their credits. And so if they can make the case that I have to be at work a certain time, we have seen studies in Southern California and other places where they do seem to benefit the nurses and other people with really fixed um, arrival times at work or for childcare purposes, they actually really like the reliability that the, the tolls have added to their, it, it reduces that, that stress and that dread of being late and, and possibly losing their job, not their kid, but you know, losing maybe 10 bucks a minute for a late pickup on a kid. And um, so it, it does make a lot of sense if you if you take the time to kind of intellectually invest in it. But the, the big question I think that they're still going to be saddled with is who qualifies. So uh, the time is up. The time always flies in this form. So thank you so much, Cara. Mm -hmm. This is a really great presentation and conversation, of course. Yeah. Everybody, please join me. Thank Professor Buckman for the presentation today. Thank you, everybody.